So, Tasmania and the Australian art world and um, contemporary museum practice have all felt effects from um, Mona since it opened in January uh, 2011. So much has been written about Mona. Even before it was open, there was a lot written. Um, it's the largest private museum in Australia. Um, there aren't actually all that many, although there are many than there were early in my career. Um, and a lot has also been written about all the rest of the things Mona does, which is a rich range of programs and festivals and ancillary things. So we have art from um, really ancient, I think the earliest things are some Nakada pots from about 4000 BCE. Um, and remembering all art was once contemporary, was once new. Um, this is spread through 6,000 square metres of exhibition space over three levels of uh, permanent exhibition display. And it's cut into the bedrock of the River Derwent north of Hobart. We also have changing exhibitions, probably more now than we did when we opened in 2011. We have music and performance. This is um, one of the special events you can see on the screen. Wonderful food, there's a restaurant, a cafe, a wine bar, um, a winery, a brewery, um, places to stay, an outdoor summer market, um, environmental projects, uh, a big range of publications and more. So, um, this guy. Um, Mona won the 2012 Australian Tourism Award for the Best New Development a year after we opened, and it is apparently Tasmania's biggest, uh, most visited attraction, about neck and neck with Port Arthur, I think. Lonely Planet in 2013 said that Tasmania or Hobart was one of the top ten cities in the world to visit, and they said largely because of Mona. Um, the re recent arrival of the world-class Mona Museum, they said. Versions of the Mona O, which is the label electronic a label device that you walk around with and tells you where you are and what you're looking at. We've sold to the um, State Library in New South Wales and the Melbourne Zoo, um, and it's being looked at by international uh, museums as well. And we've sent exhibitions to Paris, Theatre of the World, and Shah Shah, Beam in Thine Own Eye. So um, we've actually done a fair amount in the four years since we opened. We've now had over, uh, well over a million, I think nearly one and a half million visitors. Um, and the city, Hobart's population is not much more than 200,000. So that's repeat visitors in Hobart and a lot of people from the mainland, as um, the rest of Australia is called, and internationally as well. And in fact, last year was a record for Tasmanian tourism, up 6% on the year before. And we are told that a large part of that's to do uh, with, with Mona. In fact, the Australian Research Council has set up a study called The Mona Effect, which has its own website, you can have a look at it, um, and it uh, takes in uh, the University of Tasmania, Monash University on the mainland, and Mona, and um, I'll be very interested to hear their findings at the end. However, Mona's aim, I think, if there is an aim, and there possibly isn't, is more to affect than to have an effect. We want visitors to, um, to provoke visitors to ponder their assumptions. We don't want to uh, create some predetermined effect, um, have specific pre-planned outcomes, really anything but. Um, Mona is our owner, David Walsh's um, personal experiment and he doesn't like pre-set pre, uh, outcomes. It's shifting, it's challenging, it's mercurial, it's fun, it's meant to be fun, and it's meant to be evolving um, as, we, as, as it happens. Uh, David, in fact, is very interested in evolution, in evolution of all things, including our species, of which more um, later. And like uh, human evolution, Mona has uh, no goal or end point, although he has remarked that it could be <laughs> under the Derwent River in 20 years or so with global warming, and he's also said he might build a science museum. He hasn't explained whether that means finishing Mona and having the science museum or we're running both. We'll, we'll wait and see. Um, he's also decided that having 
began with this idea that he would, excuse my language, piss people off, including academics, and I think he included me in that, um, and, um, cu you know, conventional curators. He's actually decided he quite likes the fact that people like Mona. He doesn't... We don't pander to our visitors, but we're quite pleased when they have a good time. And he's increasingly realising it's quite good if they have a good time and spend money while they're there. So if you haven't yet been over the ditch to Mona, I don't think today's talk will be a spoiler. Um, I'm not going to show you more than a fraction of the collection. I'm not even going to tell you in detail about all the projects we've done. And I haven't brought any food, wine or beer. Um, if you are wondering whether um, the so-called Mona effect um, means that all or many of, of what aspects of what we've done uh, can be replicated elsewhere, I'll say from the outset, I don't entirely believe um, it does. The fact that a museum can affect a city's profile is undoubtedly true. I mean, think the Bilbao effect. But I think that this is a side effect of the museum's success in the first place and not part of the museum's mission. Um, and um, so hopefully some of the things I show you will give you um, ideas and we like, as I'll explain more, uh, to learn from other museums. I've been learning a lot while I've been here. But um, this isn't a blueprint for how to do what Mona's done. Uh, we do like big parties and we, um, we, we try to have... We, in fact, our openings now are more or less public, so we'll do something like a lunch for the artist involved or curators and um, lenders and so on, but then the openings are big and public. And some of this, um, I guess, is some of the effect of the community feeling involved um, is the fact that it's so open and so celebratory, I guess. We have... There definitely are effects with increased visitation. People who would have come perhaps to Australia but not have come to Tasmania or who might have come to Tasmania to go tramping or bushwalking, as we call it, but they will come to, to look at an art gallery. That's definitely true. Fuller aeroplanes, uh, more hotels, busy restaurants, additional employment. Um, but as I say, these things have happened because Mona's different from anywhere else. And um, basically, really, I suppose one could say, unless you clone David, um, <laughs> you're not really going to uh, clone Mona. If you'd like more detail on David, um, you can read his memoir. Um, he's generally described as humbly born, maverick, brilliant mathematician, on the spectrum, professional gambler. And um, most of you probably know, but possibly some of you don't, Mona is actually funded entirely by David and he does make his money from mathematic, the mathematics of gambling. So um, he has no money in the bank, as far as I understand. He makes his money and he spends it on Mona. His memoir is really worth reading. Um, he's really pleased when it sells as well because he's always looking for ways to, um, to, to um, fund the eight million at least that it costs him a year to run. And the building itself cost about 80 million to build, plus he stocked it with collections. So, um, but the memoir is called A Bone of Fact. And it's, it's not... Um, you know, I was born here, I grew up in Glenorchy, etc. But as you read it, he takes different themes of what interests him, what he's passionate about, and then weaves his life story into it. And um, is a lot about explana explaining the mathematics of the gambling. But um, he, is th he thinks about that, he says, all the time. So he's always one step ahead in how he's working out the algorithms and um, how it's going to work. Um, there are some things we definitely can teach you. We can sell you the Mona O, for example. Uh, oh, sorry. That's my colleague Olivier, Olivier Varenne, who's based in London. I'm based in Melbourne with some of the other curators. Um, and that is the O that he's holding. And this is this um, label device, which uh, we have no labels on the walls. And this has a, it was invented by my colleagues in IT department, also based in Melbourne. And um, it, you can save your tour. So I write some of it, um, David writes some of it, 
and uh, you can read what you didn't have time for or you weren't inclined to read when you're looking at the objects immersed in the museum. You can read it later at home. And as I said, we get ideas from other museums, other people, all the time. In fact, David said at the very beginning that he'd thought about all the museums he'd visited around the world and um, wanted to include as many of the favourite elements as possible. But crucially, he then wanted Mona to be completely different from any of them. And also, it's not as though he was ever going to have the raw materials for a Louvre or a Met. We go from ancient, we go through Australian modernism, I guess, um, some African pre-Columbian, to very contemporary, but there's actually not, there's no Renaissance in the middle. Um, so he began with, um, what I showed you briefly before, a little museum on the site, uh, which he opened in the 1990s, and this was the Marilla Museum of Antiquity. So this was what he first collected. He did collect uh, coins a little bit as a child, but as I mentioned, he was very, um, he came from very modest origins. And really it was when he started making his gambling money that he started buying these antiquities. And um, he bought the site in the, uh, I think in about 1993, because it was going to be divided up for a housing estate. And he decided that he had this collection and he would put it in the uh, modernist 1950s house on the site built by the Australian architect Roy Grounds for uh, Italian uh, vigneron, uh, Claudio Alcorso. Um, and this house is now the museum entrance. It was a heritage building. This little museum that was free to the public was essentially based on the um, Enlightenment view that um, understanding through catalogue knowledge. And as you can see, there were labels absolutely everywhere, which David wrote, and he learned as he wrote them. So he researched and he learned. And he's often spoken about the huge influence that um, TMAG, the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, which is the main state uh, museum in Hobart and does um, um, every, natural history, cultural history and art, the huge influence that it had on him as a child. In fact, his mother thought he was at Mass and he was at TMAG. Um, so this idea of a museum as a source of knowledge and particularly of self-education for David, I think, he also <coughs> spent a lot of time in the local library, um, what is very important to David. His interests have changed and evolved over the years, so we now end up where um, a lot of what he's spending the money on is commissions based around our exhibition pro projects, and uh, rather than going out and buying individual objects, but that could change. Um, and, but that I think he's found, first of all, of course, he had more space, as you'll see in a minute, um, and secondly, he's found he really enjoys being a part of the creation, creation pro process when you commission a work and you're there from start to finish. I guess, in part, having done that with the building, he's now doing it with the art. He still enjoys knowledge. Here he is in the White Library, which is a, a room full of books that are blank. Um, it's an artwork. Um, and for all that, he did once tell the press that Mona would be a subversive adult Disneyland. He it is utterly serious about research, documentation, conservation, and the custodianship of what we've got there. It's very much a museum about ideas as well as objects. From the moment you approach the entrance, this wavy mirrored wall which is laid over the front of that 1950s house, the, the um, idea is that you will change your mind or change your perspective, maybe change your mind. Mona doesn't want to tell people what to think, but we are passionate, and this really does come from David, about making, making people think. Um, he likes to be uncertain, and he wants us all to be uncertain too, which is, um, I'm not as good at walking the tightrope as he is. Um, I remember in one of our earliest planning meetings back in uh, 2007, he said, we want to make people uncomfortable. He, this is an artwork as well, uh, known as Cunellus. We don't have it hanging with meat all the time. We did at the opening. It mostly actually has ropes um, instead, but from time to time he puts out the meat. And he's a vegetarian himself. He doesn't mind if people eat meat. He'd like people to think about the processes 
behind eating meat. Um, and all the other things we do. Um, he says that um, he's, it's basically think, ignore, he, he's, he is impatient with the way people ignore things or shelve things away because they're difficult to think about. He thinks we should think about everything and that the more we um, are self-aware, the more we're likely to align our behaviour with our principles. So while I catalogue the artworks and I write a little of what I find interesting about them, it's very sweetly by my colleagues, mostly called Art Wank, which is meant to be ironic. <laughs> and on the O, the um, button you push to get the artwork is actually a penis and scrotum. Um, <laughs> but sometimes we change the name. So for the most recent exhibition, Matthew Barney, um, I was Earth and my colleague was Unearth. But um, yes, yeah, so while I write the art wank or whatever it's called, David and my brilliant um, writer colleague Elizabeth Pierce might also con contribute something under Gonzo or Unearth or whatever we call it about war or sex or literature, euthanasia, parenthood or eating meat. And we publish quite a lot in books as well and they range across this um, from the, the serious research to the responsive and, I guess, thought-provoking. We, we do deal in big ideas. So I'll tell you a little bit more about how we've reached the point that we're at now. Um, this is the site I mentioned. So you can see that that square courtyard house, this is in the 1960s. Uh, the vineyard was the first uh, vineyard in southern Tasmania, and, and we still produce a lot of wine there, although David has vineyards elsewhere in Tasmania. So um, this was the estate built for Claudia Corso, two houses by Roy Grounds. The round one is now the library, and the square one, as I mentioned, is the entrance. And you can see there in 2007, we literally started excavating under the round house, three levels down into the riverbank. And this is what's now the lift shaft, and those walls are the wall of the museum. That as you go down. So there's a lift shaft and a spiral staircase there now. Um, David um, had taken on one of Australia's most exciting architects, the Greek-born Nonda Katsalidis, um, great exhibition designers. He'd filched our head exhibition designer from TMAG, lighting technicians, including the chief one from the NGV, IT inventors who invented things like the O, and a really inspired and hard-working team who, I guess, the principle is to do things as well as they can be done, um, and importantly, in ways that he still hopes will surprise him. He gives us an incredibly long leash, even though everything that happens is David. Um, how things are done, there's a great deal of freedom. and. Um, case in point is this case full of uh, projectile points which Adrian Spinks, our exhibition designer, there's a big collection of these um, prehistoric stone arrowheads and in the old museum they've been kind of lined up in rows with labels and Adrian first of all designed these amazing um, iPhone-like cases which actually were before the iPhones appeared so that was something in the, in the water or in the air. And then he did this starburst of flints and hadn't shown David um, how they'd be. And David actually wrote in the O this little appreciation. I wrote about what the flints were and David wrote what a wonderful designer Adrian was. Um, so th this idea of doing things differently, doing things in a way that um, fit with his vision but aren't Preconce uh, that he will be pleased with the surprise is part of, I think, how it works. Um, and that then, I guess, is also carries through to surprising the visitors. We, as I said, I think we don't want to pander to visitors. We, want, we don't want to give visitors what we think they want. We want to give them something that's different and surprising. When we were first pre preparing the planning brief back in 2007-2008, David was very pleased and said, that'll give us something to deviate from. 
and we're still deviating in every single thing we do. It's actually one of the things that I say don't try to emulate too much unless you're very brave, pretty rich, and also have no trustees or bean counters to answer to, which of course is um, something that most museums can't actually um, emulate. You need a kind of a Medici, really. And um, if you don't have a revenue stream like David Walsh or Cosimo, and for those who heard my talk last year in Launceston, apologies, because I use this, I just think it's such a fabulous analogy. Um, it's just the, the look, and it wasn't deliberate. But you can still be as flexible, nimble, and open to new ideas as possible. Um, I do admit that sometimes at Mona we feel like we don't know what we're doing, but I think actually almost anyone working with contemporary art and commissions probably feels that way because you don't know what you're doing. You're setting something uh, free to happen and um, see what happens. Um, David likes to take that approach across the board, I guess, to see what happens. And as I say, he gives us a lot of freedom to do it. Over the recent years, we've unrolled a really very ambitious project, program of exhibitions and um, related events, largely led, I uh, guess, the exhibition program by Olivier, who I showed you, who's based in London, and Nicole Derling, uh, the co-director of exhibitions, who's in Melbourne with me. Um, I head up the curatorial research publications um, interpretation side of things. And um, we've got more exhibitions planned out to at least 2017 and some hoped for 2018. Um, so a bit more about Mona. Just getting there is quite exciting. You can see it's not an island, but it's known as Frying Pan Island. So there you can see the building. It's mainly made of uh, concrete and cortine steel. And the best way to get there is um, by Mona Roma or ferry. So um, from, from the mainland, obviously, most people fly in. And from, if for internationals, it's not so different from here. It's kind of next stop Antarctica. So the whole idea of um, getting there is quite exciting to many people. And then you take the Mona Roma. If you want to, you can go in the posh pit, which is quite expensive. Um, if someone else is paying, I recommend it. But otherwise, I think go on the normal bit and you get coffee, you can buy a drink. And it's about uh, 40 minutes up the river. And you get a little talk about um, how the min river's full of um, zinc from the zinc works. And you can see Cadbury's, the chocolate factory, as you go. Um, and it really is a great way to... It's probably one of the most um, spectacular entrances you'll make to a museum. And when you arrive and you make your way up these stairs, which are a bit like going up to an ancient Greek temple, you really um, don't really know much what's there. And that was intended. So this is the steps coming up. David's apartment's actually under that bit. But there's really not a lot there. And that was very deliberate. The, David didn't want a museum that um, confronted you with columns and awe-inspiring, you know, come in and we will tell you all. He wanted this idea that you arrived and you really wasn't, weren't sure what you were coming to. Um, so that the building was intended to be underwhelming, at least from the outside. Although, because as always, evolving, uh, David's buying more big works, we do now have a Wim Delvoir concrete mixer on a flatbed truck sitting on the roof. Um, and as I'll show you later, uh, James Terrell work as well. Um, and there's, a, uh, there's some other works, there's a work in the car park and there are things that are spreading simply because they don't fit inside. But the idea was that you'd get there and there'd be mostly plants, and, uh, plants on the roof and um, a tennis court as well. So, so you walk across the tennis court and you go through that mirror. Now, um, Nanda wanted the mirror and he didn't want the tennis court. But in the end, David said Nanda could have the mirror if he could have the tennis court. And as you can see, it actually works beautifully together. You get this amazing sort of reflection of the landscape and the tennis court as you, as you go in. A bit like Alice going through the looking glass. And then you head right downstairs, down um, that, through the bedrock that I showed you, um, into the museum. So this work, which we have bought now, was installed in this um, cut in the sandstone for an exhibition that we did a couple of years ago called The Red Queen, um, which was obviously interactive. It made noise and people jumped on it. Um, 
but normally we have Julius Pop's bit fall in that space and it's just actually been reinstalled, having been uh, also supplanted by Matthew Barney work. Um, this stone wall is a living wall. When it rains, there's actually, um, it's mossy and a bit of water comes um, out, I can assure all lenders that it is all climate controlled and um, no works besides the pop or how near here. But um, it's an extraordinary wall and it it's actually was a quarry for the uh, sandstone that Hobart was built from and David had hoped that we might be able to build more of Mona by excavating but those um, 19th century quarrymen knew where to stop and in fact um, bits of the wall you can see here for example uh, one of many pins holding it back because it's um, it, it, behind there it's actually well, this rock and earth, but it, it is a really um, organic thing. But David also likes to say it's the oldest um, work in the museum, being Triassic. But um, it does have the most amazing effect. Again, I think um, a lot of people who come to Mona say the building is the thing they love most of all. And there's no doubt that the whole is greater than the sum <coughs> of the parts. The collection is good, it's interesting, but it's not... Uh, well, as I say, there's no, I said before, there's no Mona Lisa or anything like that. But the entire experience from the materials to the building to the programs, I think, add up to, um, to what the effect is. Um, don't miss queuing up to go across the water. We only take two, and, two at a time, as though you're making a voyage to the afterlife to see the virtual unwrapping of Posiris, our 70-year-old mummy in his plaster a coffin. Um, he's a, a Roman period mummy and although probably at the time he was buried this was probably not such a rare uh, object, um, it is actually rare now because it's made of plaster and so many of the plaster coffins were smashed open by uh, tomb dealers or whatever, robbers and dealers, to see what was inside and get the little scarabs out and so on. Or, of course, if they got wet, they were gone forever. So, Posiris, I like to think his family, when they wrapped him up in the plaster, wanting his name and his body to be preserved, they never would have known how well he was preserved at Mona. <laughs> and, um, it's um, an interesting uh, idea, I think, of an extension of what the intention was of his family, um, where he's ended up for now. I'm sure he'll live longer than any of us. Um, so at Mona there are quiet moments of contemplation, there's light, there's movement, um, there's a lot of uh, noise. This is Lozano Hema on the left where you can, um, ha it measures your heartbeat. Uh, it's an affirmation of life in a museum where we have things like um, Posiris and the Serrano of the person who died of AIDS. And um, it's also just, uh, it's actually off display at the moment, but when it was shown there, it was adjacent to the cinerarium wall where you can actually have your ashes interred for 70,000 Australian dollars um, and be at Mona in perpetuity. And then on the other side, Conrad Shawcross, this um, wildly Heath Robinson-like device uh, with, of robotic machines. Um, they have both been deinstalled for the moment because next month we have an exhibition of Marina Abramovic opening uh, which will run through till I think September. Um, there are a lot of videos at Mona. This is Candace Bright's Madonna, the Madonna fans lip syncing away to um, her Like a Virgin um, album. Um, and basically not many museums well, actually, there probably are some now as noisy, but this is a noisy one, and it also can be a smelly one as well. Um, there's a lot that's quite visceral. This is this is another installation, actually, which we've deinstalled, but uh, this, w this was where we actually tried having an area that we said to people, maybe don't take your children if they're under 15. Um, but I personally found it quite, I think it's quite a good way of talking to children about all kinds of things. And anyway, um, they were, the, on the right there is the beautiful chair which is a euthanasia machine. Literally you can sit in that chair and press a button and you see the green liquid in the syringe go down and you're told what would be happening if it was, um, if you were taking a lethal dose or this amazing uh, Belinda de Brooke here, horse based on 
uh, horses in the First World War, the carnage not only of people but of animals in that war. Um, but what we found was that um, people mostly were not particularly confronted. I think we thought they would be more. And in fact, the work that gets the most press, which I don't think I've brought a slide of and that David took down for a while because people kept talking about it, was uh, the same artist that did the beautiful chair, Greg Taylor, did a row of um, porcelain vulvas. And we had this thing where... And they were not on the floor for the under-15s. Um, there's 140 of them, I think, and they're portraits, basically, of real people. And people would come in and say to the front of house, where are the vaginas? So <laughs> David took them down. But they've been put up for a while again lately. There's this idea... Um, uh, in fact, he had a very famous picture, the world... The, um, world record for Australian art, the John Brack, the bar. And he sold that in the end to the National Gallery of Victoria for what he'd paid for it, because he didn't want people coming in saying, where's the bar, unless they meant the bar where they could buy a drink down on the bottom floor. He didn't want people coming in looking at one particular thing. We want the um, experience to be uh, very multifaceted. So, yes, so this under-15 area is now uh, part of the, going to be part of the Marina Abramovic show. But the smelly bits are still there. The cloaca professional is um, permanently in there. It's plumbed in, it's wired in. And this is Wim Delfoy's work, uh, which replicates the human digestion machine. And this is actually the only one that he sold. That's why it's professional. Um, otherwise, he just lends them. We did do a whole show of Delfoy where we had... Um, three working uh, cloaca machines. Um, this much more efficient than the earlier models, not as smelly. Um, but this, uh, it's fed t twice a day and it defecates once a day. Um, it doesn't do well on junk food. It's better with a healthy, a healthy meals. We've tried all that. Um, there's a great weight of flesh at um, Mona, not always as great as when Stuart's does his naturist tour, uh, <laughs> which has also morphed into now there's a nude swim during the winter mofo. He's not involved, but it's... Um, it's um, and it's even spread, actually. Canberra, the National Gallery of Australia, did a nude viewing of Tyrell's um, Gansfeld space a couple of months ago, and I suspect that was down to Mona. Um, there's also a great weight of history. This is a really fantastic piece. We have two Anselm Kiefer works, and this is his Stern and Fall, which you can see by the size of the people. It's this great lead and glass and steel bookcase, and one of those books has actually fallen out and smashed the glass. <coughs> and because lead um, is molten, it's slowly always moving. So. Um, you can't actually go any closer than those people because um, we don't want any books to fall on people, and I hope no more will fall. But it's a, again, it's a kind of a living artwork um, and living history. And to get to it, you go through, um, through the museum, through a tunnel to the library, that roundhouse, and then on, on the way you can do rubbings from stones from the railway station at Hiroshima, which are part of an installation by a pair of Japanese artists, and then you come to the kefir that's in its own pavilion. And then if you look out the windows, the only windows in the museum that look out, except our offices, um, you can see Wim Delfoy's chapel, uh, which was installed, um, I think, in 2012, and David was actually married there, recently. He himself is an avowed atheist, but <coughs> he doesn't mind who believes what. He was brought up a Catholic. Um, he just hopes that people think seriously about why they believe the things they do. He's endlessly fascinated in why humans do what they do. Not now, but always. Um, these are some flint uh, creatures by Hubert Duprat, who we did a, a small retrospective, and they are done by the same method as Neolithic flint napping. Um, they're big, though, they're sort of this size, not like an arrowhead or an axe. And also in that exhibition were these wonderful caddisfly larvae, which um, Duprat has patented the way of making them build their cases like this with stones and uh, gold and diamonds instead of twigs and stones. And, of course, this prompts the question, what, what does make something an artist and what is art anyway? Another thing which David is um, struggling with his own 
um, ideas about how you define what's art in a museum that's full of things that possibly weren't even intended to be art when they were made, um, and a lot of contemporary art, which he has always said is philosophy more than art in a traditional sense, but he's in the throes of working out why he thinks that's not right. You'll have to read it in the catalogue next year if he works it out. Um, and another of our exhibitions, The Red Queen, uh, looked in a rather general exploratory way at the evolutionary origins of art making, and that's our biggest current project is an extension of that. The Red Queen was intended as a springboard for future exhibitions which would look more closely and the one that I'm particularly working on at the moment for next year and the one why David's struggling with this idea of what is art, um, we are working with scientists as well as artists and art historians to put together an exhibition called On the Origin of Art. This focus on human evolution, by the way, is the origin of a red herring, which is dearly loved by the more dumb it down sections of the media. When David, um, before opening, off the cuff one day said, oh, most art, at, most art, I don't know that he even said most art at Mona, but anyway, most art is about sex and death. And the media leapt on it, and it was suddenly, oh, this museum's going to be full of risque things and scary things, and it's all about sex and death. What he meant was not that it was about sex and death as subject matter, although there is a fair amount of that there, but rather that the motivations for making art had always been, in part at least, about showing off, therefore getting a mate, or prestige and um, status, or um, averting the oblivion of death. So, so much funerary art, for example, or even the idea of leaving something behind you that will have a life longer than you. So, for example, the um, beaded mummy uh, covering that you can see in the foreground there, or just being a famous artist in the first place, or, of course, a famous collector, a museum owner. So Mona is more about, um, less about sex and death specifically, and more about human behaviour. Life as it's always been, the good, the bad, the messy, the ugly, the funny and the incandescent. Um, I think you really do feel a sense of David's ever active, fervently wide-ranging, raise a sharp mind at Mona. You also will have got the idea that his hair grows very fast. Um, <laughs> he cuts it from time to time. And visitors do respond, I think, to the fact that his personality is there, his energy, his intellect, intellect his generosity, and also, I think, what uh, that uh, curiosity and energy that I hope comes through us. He began very much by making Mona for himself, and now he's quite pleased that he's taking us all along for the ride. And I think that um, for those of you who heard Lucy Hammond speaking yesterday about how much an art, a curator is present in an exhibition, um, how much, uh, I was also thinking about Marina Abramovic, how much an artist is present there along with his or her artworks, I think this idea of David's presence in the museum gives people a freedom to feel uh, that they have something to say. And I mean, they can do a press, love or hate, on the O, we're working on ways that they can respond more than that, but the, it gives people a freedom to respond in the way um, that they want to and not feel that they're being guided in everything they do, even though then if they want scholarly specialist information about an object, they can get it, but they don't have to have it if they don't want it, and they can come to Mona even just to you know, drink absinthe at the bar, really, we don't mind. Um, you're meant to get lost at Mona, um, most certainly in the, per in the permanent collection areas where everything is put really quite randomly, well not randomly, that's not right, we've put it quite carefully, but with no taxonomy, uh, old next to new, international next to Australian, whatever. Less so obviously in some of the special exhibitions, um, especially a one-person exhibition, but you, you know, that's very liberating. It doesn't matter where you start. You can start on the bottom level or whichever. You can stop for a drink at the bar. You can go up for fresh air at the cafe or um, outside and uh, wander around looking at that beautiful scenery. Um, and that's, I think that's really, that freedom is part again of the effect. Somehow I think the juxtapositions 
um, encourage people to look closely and carefully at objects as individual things. Um, and, um, and also, as I mentioned, you can actually save the tour. So anything that you click on on the O, you get first of all basic label information, but then you may not want to read everything David says about his girlfriends or um, <laughs> his time at TMAG there on the spot, but it will come, you'll get it emailed to you, look at it um, lately, uh, later. Um, and I think that this allows, again, people to make connections according to what, how they feel at the time, really, um, to find it um, an overwhelming experience as a whole or to delve deeply into something that has a personal connection. Um, as I've said already, David's very happy to mine ideas from other museums and institutions, and he's always been fascinated, this idea of putting old and new and mixing things up and not having labels. He was certainly inspired by John Soane's Museum in London, one of my absolute favourite museums, um, built by an architect uh, for his own collection and then left to the nation partly because his son squabbled over the inheritance and he didn't want them to have any. And it's still much the same after nearly 200 years. And then, and so this is one of David's favourites among many. Um, and he was also very inspired in 2007, right in the early design phase, by Art Tempo um, in the Palazzo Fortuny. And he actually invited the curator, Jean-Hubert Martin, to come and do a show with us uh, which happened in 2012, Theatre of the World. And that show, also we partnered with TMAG, the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, and that was the one we sent to, um, to Paris. Um, objects really uh, spoke in extraordinary ways in that exhibition. So you've got a Giacometti, one of our um, mummy cases, and then the tarpa cloths from TMAG, which had actually never been displayed before. And our most recent exhibition, which closed just last month, was Matthew Barney, a huge and inter incredibly complicated show for a very big name, very complicated American artist and filmmaker. Um, the exhibition actually originated at Munich's Haus der Kunst and ran there for a few months, and it goes next to Los Angeles, but only at Mona were Barney's works placed together with the ancient Egyptian works which inspired his project. Um, inspired via the very complicated novel by Norman Mailer, Ancient Evenings. This was an exhibition about mythology, sex, death, rebirth, reincarnation, masculinity, the rise and fall of empires, um, the American automobile industry uh, and oil industry inter alia. Um, this is the canopic chest, which is a great bronze sculpture, and it's actually cast from part of a car that was wrecked during the film opera that was part of the project. And these uh, objects at the front are the uh, canopic uh, Egyptian uh, the jars that the viscera were put in when a mummy was made, which, uh, in your imagination, came out of the bit of the car body there. It was a very complicated show. And um, this is a still from the film which went with it, which we showed. Uh, which, and this is part of the casting of a gigantic sculpture in the Brooklyn Navy Yard dry dock. Uh, we showed the film. You didn't need to have seen the film to see the exhibition, but it probably helped. It's five and three quarter hours though. If it comes to New Zealand, definitely see it. It is absolutely extraordinary. And uh, Barney also did a performance at the, in the exhibition didn't look like this. It was the Glenorchy women's football team um, dragging a great lump of graph ash around the walls and drawing on the walls. And I should finish. In January this year, we opened the American light and colour artist James Terrell's Sky Space, I mentioned. So this is really an evolution where Nanda and David wanted this idea that you wouldn't really see much at the top of Mona and suddenly we're looking like the lighthouse at Alexandria and you really can't miss it. Um, 
So this is what I mean about changing his mind. This is um, the largest sky space that Tyrell has made of uh, many around the world, and it, he called it Amana after the um, open to the sky peristyle temples in ancient Greece. And of course, they, it's also an echo of the Roy Grand's house that's the uh, entrance part of Mona. Um, and um, it's open, it has heated seats, and it's open obviously at sunrise and sunset, and you see this extraordinary colour and light show um, uh, earlier in winter, but colder, and later in summer, but warmer. Um, and we are building actually a couple more terrell spaces as well. Um, Mona projects have also gone off-site, but still in Hobart. So we do two festivals a year, and I'm not really involved in these now. This is like a whole branch. They're in a separate building, and uh, the next winter festival will open next month. Then we do a summer festival as well, which have a lot of music, dance, performance, but always a visual component. Um, this year's Dark Mofo, opening in June, will inc include a work by Anthony McCall, the British-American light artist, and that will involve a ship going up the Derwent with beam of light um, going across the landscape, uh, among other things in Mona. David would be the first to admit, I think, that he's been lucky to be at the right place in the right time. One of the dangers of admitting influence, he says, is that it perpetuates a widely held myth, the myth that success breeds success. If I happen to do something interesting that generates notoriety, he says, it's likely that I'll start to believe that the notoriety was inev inevitable. It wasn't. Mostly I just got lucky. Um, I do believe that we have been lucky, that uh, the 2011 to now period that we've been opening, open, um, the world was kind of a bit ready for Mona. If we hadn't done it, maybe someone else would. Um, Mona is a little like the internet in a web of global interconnectedness that we all share, but we all explore differently. And you can dive in and you can find almost anything. Um, things you're looking for, things you weren't looking for, an array of things that you never even knew about, and that where everything is of equal weight, because, um, of course, in the internet, everything's digital, and therefore equally accessible or equally irrelevant, um, local, international, etc. Um, importantly, though, of course, like all our museums, Mona's filled with real objects. That's our business. And I think it is that physical reality combined with that sense of infinite exploration um, that makes Mona work and makes museums so important in this, um, in this world. Um, this is just another installation shot. And... Um, the Australian landscape painter Fred Williams once apparently said that museums are safe places for dangerous ideas. And I think that this concept is forgotten sometimes not by curators and um, museum professionals so much, but perhaps by our numbers-driven marketing cost-benefit ratio world of trustees and the bean counters I mentioned. In fact, I've heard David say that you can take just 10% risk for good results. Because if you bomb, you've only made a 10% loss. But if it works, if things turn out OK, the impact will be worth way more than 10% any, any day. And I think David's appetite for a really professional, lifelong understanding of risk is a very big part of Mona. It actually takes quite an effort, I think, not to come out of the museum exhilarated, whether you like the art or not, and inspired by what's possible. Um, so for those who haven't been, um, come soon, and for those who've been, come again because it will be different. Thank you.